Welcome, everyone, to our April edition of TRC Talks, Ideas and Inspiration. And I cannot tell you how excited I'm about this. I think I get more and more excited each and every month. And this time, I just know you're going to walk away from here with ideas and inspirations uh, because that's what it's all about, is it not? And so hopefully the weather for you is a little bit better than it is for me here. Uh, we have been in, uh, well, we still are in thunderstorm warnings, and we've had a couple of tornado warnings today. So all of a sudden, if I hear a big old choo-choo train and I book it on out of here, uh, y'all know what'll happen. And uh, our guest can just talk to you herself and come up with her own questions because I know she can do that. Um, but I just kind of wanted to lay that down for you. But today I am excited uh, to have joining us a good friend of mine, somebody that I get to say is truly a friend. You know, a lot of times you say, oh, my good friend. You know, this is somebody that, uh, you know, I just can't wait to see when we're at conferences together. And then, you know, just to kind of get some uplifting, encouraging texts from her every now and then. And I just knew she would be a great person to fill this April slot because, you know, April showers today bring May flowers. And if we are not planning as chambers right now uh, to enter and to kind of soar into this COVID recovery time, uh, we're definitely missing the boat. And so just due to her vast experience uh, in the chamber world and nonprofits, uh, as well as her new position at ACCE, I knew she would fit this April slot to help give you uh, just the tools that you need to grow your chamber uh, through using not only ACCE that I know she's going to talk about, but many additional things that she's experienced along her chamber career. She has served as president and CEO for a number of chambers. Uh, then she was fortunate enough to uh, run the national division of constant contact for chambers and organizations. And most of us uh, know her uh, through one of those two ways. And uh, very recently, she announced that uh, she joined forces with ACCE and she is now part of their executive team. And so without any further ado, I am going to welcome my friend Anissa Starnes to TRC Talks. Hey, my friend, how are you? I am doing well. Always good to see your smiling face. Likewise, likewise. Oh, well, I tell you, you know, we're coming out of COVID, and one day I'll be glad when we can see smiling together in person. Uh, but I will tell y'all, uh, Anissa has for a number of years now done a, uh, a webinar or a seminar back then, you know, when they were in person in, in sessions uh, about self-care. And it was one of the best things that I've even heard throughout this past year in uh, COVID about just how to take care of yourself. So since some of us are still experiencing uh, parts of COVID that maybe other parts of the country aren't, we're going to start just general. And so, you know, go way back there and pull out something. What would you say are your top two self-care tips, especially for chamber professionals? Oh, my goodness. Well, certainly I've had to pull into my bag of tricks these last couple of weeks as starting a new job. My husband and I um, bought a new home. As you'll see, my walls are still very bare. haven't decorated the office yet, but uh, you know, doing everything at once. I've had to dig deep to uh, remember my own lessons about self-care. I would say that my top two for me are disconnecting, making sure that you absolutely have some time, even if it's just a couple of hours a week, or if you can't take a full vacation or a long weekend, just disconnecting from the phone, putting it away, not staring at the screen, um, back in January, 1st of February, I actually took social media off of my phone altogether. And I can't tell you how good that was for me to not have that constant flow of information coming in. So disconnecting, definitely. Uh, and saying no, saying no when you can. Um, we can't always say no, as we all know, when things or certain people come our way and ask us to do something, we can't always say no. But think about the things you can say no to if it's a personal commitment or something that you just can't take on right now that you need to say, hey, you know what? I can't do that in April, but can we get back together first of June? That looks much better. And just being able to set boundaries because uh, just like our Internet, we all have a certain bandwidth. 
and it can run out sometimes for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, start the show with some good stuff. That's absolutely the case. Now, if y'all are on here, let us know who you are, where you're from, all that fun stuff. You know, we're using StreamYard, so sometimes we can't see that, but let us know. Um, and then I would also say definitely the replay. You know, all you people, if you don't see that little live button somewhere, <laughs> you're watching it at night, as I typically do on many chamber things. So still let us know where you are. But, uh, you know, taking that self-care. And as you mentioned, you know, here and what you have been and now ACCE. But how did your life course first intersect with Chambers? You know, it's always a, you know, we've been in this, both been in this business long enough to always hear the, the sometimes the horror stories of how people fell into the Chamber <laughs> world. But where did it intersect and where did it finally connect for you to go? Uh, yeah, this is my career. Yeah. Well, I don't know that I've ever met anybody that planned to be here. We all got here from a different way. And um, when I was 23 years old, uh, I found out about a six week temporary position at the Charlotte Chamber. Someone was going out on maternity leave. And so it was truly a six week temporary gig helping um, the assistant to the assistant to the president plan their annual meeting. And I did the six week gig and the person did not come back from maternity leave like sometimes happens. And I got offered the full time position and Honestly, I didn't even know what a Chamber of Commerce really did. I had heard, you know, of course about a Chamber of Commerce, but I didn't know to the depth of what they were responsible for in the community. And I, I just quickly learned to love it, love to be involved in all things in the community and uh, then started on my professional development track. Uh, had a great mentor in my first CEO, Carol Gray, who uh, luckily put forth the resources to send me to some professional development. And I, I, you know, it took me a few years to realize, hey, I might be able to stick with this and make this a career and not just a job. And then I started on an institute years later and, um, you know, fell in love with it, fell in love with the people, fell in love with the work and um, still am there today. Hey, there you are. From there. So from the desk. <laughs> To now at ACCE, where was the connection dot? How did you get to ACCE all these years later? Yeah, and it, it's almost 30 years later. Well, I wasn't that, uh, the number, but okay. <laughs> hey, I own it. But uh, one of my first, well, the first professional development that I did on staff at the Charlotte Chamber was, some of you on the call might remember, uh, NAMD, which used to be the National Association of Membership Directors for Chambers and Associations, uh, that has since rolled into ACCE. So my first conference was a NAMD conference, and I met some great, great mentors and friends at that conference that still today, Casey Steinbacher, Perry Webb, Danny Hearn, uh, met a few of those folks. Luckily, my first conference and just kept going. But after my first couple of ACCE conventions, I, I remember saying to myself, I want to work there one day. And, you know, I never really thought I saw myself moving to the D.C. area, which is where ACCE is headquartered in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and through COVID, you know, people and organizations have realized that remote work can be very uh, effective. And Sherry Ann, who's the CEO at ACCE, I started contracting with them a little over a year ago, just on some consulting and, and working some hours each week on ACCE. And as things developed, a position um, opened up and we continued the conversation and decided it was would be a good fit and jumped at the opportunity. Great. And I'm uh, I'm sure they're pleased for you to be there already. But uh, just, you know, as much as we've been engaged with ACCE, both in my prior chamber world and uh, and now on this side, glad to have you part of the team and it, help me go through. You're in charge of professional development and membership and membership retention. And I know I'm missing something else. The Knowledge Network, with, which is our Ask ACCE that some of you might have emailed. If you have any questions at all about data or, or retention numbers or statistics uh, or any question, really, you can just email Ask ACCE. And we have a great team of folks that, that man that 
that area and all of our knowledge base, which is our resource guides and our library of resources. So those are the three main areas that I'll manage. So with that, I'm going to say the question that businesses say to chamber professionals all across this country and why should I join the chamber? Well, why would you say chambers should join ACCE? It's a membership organization, just like chambers are. Where's the benefits? What, what's the benefit? Yeah. Well, and that's one I can honestly say that it's not a hard sell for me because I believe it to my core. Even when I took a couple of years break from working directly with the chamber and I ran a nonprofit, Girls on the Run International, um, I still attended the convention every year on my own dime. I made sure that I saved my money to be able to go because it was hands down the best professional development I've ever been a part of that and Institute. I just don't know where I would be without those two programs. But ACCE gave me the opportunity to have access to, you know, best practices in the industry. And I learned early on, even though I started at the Charlotte Chamber, which at the time was in the top five largest chambers in the country. Um, but I moved to a medium sized chamber and then went to an even smaller chamber. And I quickly learned that I can learn from every peer that I meet, no matter what size organization they're a part of. I learned from chambers much, much larger than me and much, much smaller than me. Uh, somebody at Institute told me one time, the only difference is a few zeros at the end of the budget or at the end of the membership number that you're of members you're serving. So, you know, just the access to the peer to peer network, the resources of the best practices, you know, is huge. Um, the industry trends, you know, having access to the dynamic chamber benchmark, which is a survey that we do every year. Many of, of the folks on the call today might be aware of that. But just being able to benchmark yourself against other like size chambers or maybe chambers that are larger than yours or smaller than yours. And you want to see what the differences are. Um, hands down, though, the peer to peer network, being able to have access to like minded people that are doing the same thing you're doing every day so that you're not alone and being able to be in either community peer groups or division work to um, join some of our fellowships, to just be involved with other people that are living what you're living every day is huge and yeah. worth every penny. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and I think you hit on it, you know, so many times, you know, Many people know, you know, my very first chamber, I had 33 members and, you know, I've shared some good stories with you over uh, over some nights about that. But, you know, early on, it was like, well, I can't talk to larger chambers. They're not going to know where I am. But like I said, you started in a metro and then went other sizes and then went back up and all of that we don't ever know where our peer groups have been yeah. and we start those conversations. And so it, it's not that we're bound by size of community or size. Absolutely of not. We're I would bet that you had some of the exact same problems I had with 4,500 members in Charlotte as you had with 33, mm -hmm. you know, it, some of the problems uh, just are across the board. It doesn't matter what size community you're in. Um, but there are certain problems and certain issues that you do need that peer to peer of somebody that's living it every day the same way. And so um, that affords you the opportunity to meet those folks as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you know, and, and we've uh, addressed it a bit in the, you know, value of ACCE and peer to peer. And, you know, I remember, I mean, I started 20 one years ago, I guess it now is. And, uh, you know, I heard a lot in my communities of small chambers going, oh, well, ACC is not really worth it. That's all for the Metro Chamber. And we heard that for so long. But, uh, you know, it doesn't take you long going to a convention or just seeing, uh, you know, ask ACCE to see that it's really not. I mean, it is for any yeah. size chamber. Um, do structure for chambers how does that relate so that if there's a smaller, medium sized chamber going, it's not in my budget right now. What, yeah. what are they expecting to add to, to access this network? Well, the ACCE dues right now are set on your total revenue for your annual budget each year. So it's a sliding scale. There's 12, um, 12 groups or classes, if you will, 
of dues. So it depends on your revenue structure. Um, this year, we've done what many of our chamber partners and members have done is We've made some exceptions for those that that needed to step back and some stepped up mm -hmm. just depending on how the year was. Um, so if a budget moves one way or the other, we work with the chamber to get them to their fair share dues mm -hmm. amount. Um, so we're we're a lot like our chamber partners in that sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I think for a smaller, medium sized chamber to hear from you right there to go, OK, I, I'm, I don't have to worry about the financial aspects of my metro neighbor. I, I can yeah. still play in that regard. Uh, kind of taking a, a little bit deeper dive. We know annual convention and such uh, in that particular aspect. It's been virtual uh, last year. It's been announced it's going to be virtual this year. Uh, I am sure that's opened up some opportunities for uh, more participation, whether it's Absolutely. Metro's being able to engage more of their staff to go, that travel would have prohibited that uh, maybe, or smaller ones experiencing it for the first time. Uh, how best can they prepare to uh, get the most golden nuggets out of convention that's coming up this summer? Well, one thing we saw last year with the first time going virtual for the summit um, was that it absolutely did open it up to folks that maybe in the past had not been able to go because of travel restrictions or, or travel budgets or lack thereof. And we saw um, a, a wider breadth of uh, staff attending last year's summit, whereas maybe just the CEO and maybe the number two person on staff would go to the convention. Last year, we saw whole staffs signing up for it because it was more affordable and um, it was never more critical for our chambers to have access to best practices and resources and programming and professional development. Because, you know, I'm not telling anybody on this call anything you don't already know, but it was a tough year mm -hmm. and motivation was getting beat up. You know, our morale was taking a hit because it's hard when you do so much and work so hard for your community and you're seeing longtime businesses maybe even close their doors or, you know, suffering because they they can't get workers when things open back up. Just all of the myriad of, of things that we faced. Um, so being able to come together, even in a virtual world, was just what everybody needed. And we saw that with our numbers. We actually had a record year last year with the number of people that attended the virtual summit over any in-person convention that we've had. And we know that that was because it was more affordable. Um, it was needed. I think we put together a super strong uh, program of, of content last year and are doing so again this year. But just people needed it and came together and supported it in a big way. Would we like to be together all hugging each other and and commiserating together and celebrating together. Absolutely. And we look forward to doing that hopefully in 2022. Um, but for this year, we're planning another really strong summit, a virtual summit, and really looking forward to, to having additional staff join us this year. And, you know, like everybody, we're looking into the future with, with a really open mind and creativity and thinking out of the box of um, how do we keep this going even when we do get to come back together. We know some people won't be willing or able to travel even next year, or maybe the year after. Um, we've opened up this hybrid world now and this virtual world. What does that look like as far as a hybrid event? We don't know yet. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we do know, and, and some of you have probably already figured this out yourself, hybrid is not just sticking a camera in a room and filming it and opening it up to people to watch. It's much more in-depth than that, um, much more coordinated. And we're looking forward to trying some of those things so that we can continue to grow our audience even, even more so that we can get the content out to folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and you are so right. I mean, even in a sponsorship world, we get questions all the time of, oh, well, you know, we're going to put a camera there and how do we still reckon? And it's like, well, there's so many added levels, yeah. you know, especially if you're going to have the attendee 
feel like they're present and feel like they're part of it. So I'm glad you addressed that future aspect because, uh, you know, that is a thought, you know, if, if people have started feeling and, and engaging in the conference and really want to do it, but budget or, uh, you know, fear of travel might constrain that. Good to know that you're beginning to look at that already yeah. a year and a half away. And, that well, and, and one thing for this year, I can't spill the beans yet. We haven't uh, publicly announced yet. But our two of our keynote speakers for this year, I am thrilled about having them at ACCE. Would we have been able to have them if we were um, live and in person? I don't know. Their schedules might not have worked. Their fee might have been even higher. You know, it's just things that you have to think of. And it does open us up to uh, a wealth of uh, speakers Absolutely. that we might not have been able to to bring to our audience. So really excited about that and, and excited to start sharing that. And well, and I will say, you know, th that's a great example just for chambers at large of, you know, because of this format that we find ourselves in the virtual world where they might not have been able to bring a, a, a named speaker to maybe yeah. a women's conference or a business solution summit or, or, or they have the opportunity to kind of stretch their wings a little bit because you don't have the travel, you don't have the timing, that fee comes down. Uh, so this would be a, a great time to see uh, maybe a different speaker that might help your attendance to get a whole nother audience that you wouldn't likely get from there. Now, we, we talk about convention just because, I mean, what's ACC without convention? I mean, we kind of book our lives around it, do we not sometimes in the summer? Yeah. So uh, in that aspect, well, let's say that just somebody can't either budgetarily get there. It's a bad week for them. Maybe they're having a festival that week. Those particular aspects. What might be some other professional development opportunities that ACCE offers, maybe in division aspects or maybe in, you know, uh, kind of genre niches in those regards that they might be able to engage uh, at other times of the year if that fits them better? You know, that's one thing that I will absolutely admit that I was kind of late to the game in taking advantage of those when I was last with the chamber because I didn't dig into all of the benefits and we're guilty of that, just like mm -hmm. our members are. You know, we get frustrated sometimes um, that our members don't realize all of the great benefits we offer to them. And sometimes that's the same way. And we have so many different community peer groups and divisions that allow for access to your peer-to-peer -peer network. Some of those are done live and in-person events. And eventually we will get back to that, of course. But um, right now they've been virtual. But just a couple of weeks ago, we held the, a sales conference for our, our staff that are in sales roles for membership development. And we had over 150 people attend that. And it, it was just such an amazing conference. We also have an events conference for our event and program folks. Um, but we have the major cities. We have metro cities. We have our hometown chamber community peer groups that people can join. Um, and we do conference calls. We do Zoom calls. We will eventually be back to in-person groups so that you can take advantage of that professional development for wherever you are um, on those scales and really, again, meet your peers across the country so that you can uh, borrow those ideas and, and share your ideas with them and, and just, you know, be together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right about experiencing membership. You know, we do get so, God, why didn't that member know that we do this in public policy that we're only looking at a ribbon cutting or those type of things? I quite a lot of times to my Sam's Club membership. You know, <laughs> I am at this tier only to get money back. I don't yeah. care about the hearing aid and the eyeglasses and all that. Now I'm getting to an age I might particularly <laughs> care for that. So it moves. But I think that's where chambers have to be with ACCE in an aspect of, letting it be a resource. If you've got a question, yeah. reach out. There's probably something there that can fit there. Yeah. Uh, now, you and I both have IOM by our names in our little corners, whatever. Proud of it. 
Absolutely. Er hard earned. Hard earned. Um, but HCCE has CCE. It's kind of the pinnacle of what we uh, aspire to be as chamber professionals. And, you know, people ask me all the time, do you have a regret moving to the other side in consulting rather than staying on the chamber side? And really probably the only regret that I do have is that I can't get a CCE yeah. now. That's the nerd in yeah. me going Nabbit. But talk to people about what CCE means and why it is so coveted and such few of us uh, have it in that regard. Yeah, the CCE, which some of you may or may not know, it's the Certified Chamber Executive Designation and ACCE sponsors and, and promotes that program. And um, it, it's it is the pinnacle. It's the pinnacle. And uh, it's not easy to do. If it was easy, everybody would do it. I have not been through it myself, but I know enough about it to know that it's not easy. And now I'm seeing the other side of it, working um, with our team at ACCE on that program. But, you know, it, it is the pinnacle and it's something that um, shows the entire body of work of a chamber executive. And uh, it, it takes years leading up to it to be able to apply for it and do it. It's not something you can just start working at a chamber today and then decide to be a CCE next week. You know, you have to have certain points leading up to it. And that takes years and years of professional development. I think I read one time um, on average, it's about six years of professional development before you have enough points to actually apply and sit for the CCE designation um, accredit, um, certification. And so it's not just something that you can just quickly do which makes it even sweeter when they do uh, achieve that. And it's, um, I don't remember the percentage right now. It's less than 500, I believe, across the country that have that CCE designation behind their name. And really, really happy to be working alongside the team on that piece of it because it is so critical. And uh, Institute is a great partner in that we work together to make sure the body of knowledge um, complements each other with the IOM and the CCE. And uh, really excited to be working closely again with uh, the good folks at the U.S. Chamber Institute program. Well, in speaking of U.S. Chamber, I'm sure you get this question. I get this question from Chamber. What's the difference in the U.S. Chamber and ACCE? Where, where's the division? Where's the heart? Yeah. I thought Sherry Ann was there. It, it all. What's the difference? Well, the U. The U.S. Chamber is um, the world's largest organization representing businesses and companies. Mm -hmm. So their members of the U.S. Chamber, for the most part, are businesses, just mm -hmm. like your members of your chamber are businesses and organizations. Now, some chambers, of course, do belong to the U.S. Chamber because they're organizations supporting their work. So the difference is, is the U.S. Chamber supports and their members are mostly businesses and organizations. ACCEs, um, main mission is professional development and development of professionals that are dedicated to working with businesses and the betterment of their communities. Mm -hmm. So our main focus at ACCE is professional development for the executives that serve the Chamber of Commerce industry. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have said it any better myself. <laughs> okay, you're new in the role. You're not in right. the chamber world at all. What have you set for yourself as your goals for the first six months at ACCE? Survival. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I told somebody yesterday, um, I'm not drinking from a fire hose. It's a tsunami mm -hmm. that uh, it is, it, it, it's a different side of things. Mm -hmm. And I can have all the experience in the world in working with chambers, working for a chamber. But this is a new gig. It's a new job. There's new processes. There's new people. Um, the team at ACCE is phenomenal. And I have known that from a distance in working with them. Um, Sherry Ann has been the president and CEO for a little over three years now. And I have been a fan of hers since she, she stepped into the role. But now getting to work with her every day and seeing that leadership and being able to gain um, gain professional development for me by working with her and the team is incredible. But yeah, it, it's a it's a new job, so that comes with 
you know, the, the newness of it all. I'm just taking it all in and being a sponge. And somebody asked me the other day, you know, what do you, what changes do you want to make? And I said, I'm not making any changes in the beginning. I, I'm just a firm believer in uh, celebrate and, and continue the success that's been happening prior to me being there. And along the way, there will eventually be things that I think, hey, why don't we do this? Or what if we try this? And uh, like everybody, I can be an overachiever sometimes. And the first couple of weeks, I started writing down things of we should do this and we should do that. And then I just had to settle down and say, you know, get your feet under you, take it all in, um, meet and, and get to know the team. That brings a, a different challenge right now in a virtual world is I'm working with a team that I have not had the pleasure to meet most of them in person. And um, we're doing some some things to help with that, just like most remote teams are doing to, to make sure you can get to know each other on a personal level, which makes it always easier to work together professionally when that happens. But um, yeah, there's a, so much great work already happening. Uh, but I do look forward to eventually getting to that place where I can say, hey, what if we try this? You know, this crazy idea I had at three o'clock in the morning. What if? Because there's there's, you know, our chamber friends have never worked harder in their lives. I know that. And I have told many of them, I don't know if I could have done this last year like some of my peers have that I've seen. It's been incredible, the work that they're doing. And um, I'm happy to be on this side supporting them. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, and. I think that's just such sound advice for any chamber professional, really any any particular job transition. But, you know, a lot of times when people get a new position at a chamber or take over the CEO role, CEO role at, a, at a new community, it's let me change, change, change. And so many times, you know, we, we've had many a discussion about, you know, it really takes a year to kind of go through the entire yeah. program of work before you get that sense of what can change and why things maybe are as revered as they are in those particular types of things. Now, you just got to ACCE, but you have not really ever left the chamber world in the aspect. And of course, we're consulting uh, in, in these years leading up to ACCE, uh, ACCE, the CCEs. I, tell you, <laughs> I mean, it's like uh, alphabet snoop. But um, throughout your career, what do you think is the greatest chamber lesson you would share with a chamber professional? Make you deep. Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, I don't know that a year, I don't know that a year and a half ago, this would have been my answer, but it certainly is today. Uh -huh. um, lead with empathy mm. and be authentic. Those are the two things that I have seen this year that the chambers that are really standing out to me in my mind of those that I have watched this year, mm -hmm. um, you know, be able to not only survive COVID, but to um, succeed successfully mm. through it um, are those that led with empathy that, you know, I don't have all the answers. Um, I can empathize with what you're going through right now. and Maybe I've never lived through it as a small business owner or a restaurateur or, you know, whatever the case may be, but just being empathetic to what yeah. our members are going through. And I have seen some amazing case studies of that yeah. happening over the last year. And then being authentic. I saw so many chamber execs take their suits off and go on Facebook Live sitting in their living room with three, four, five kids bouncing off the walls, trying to do homeschooling. And they're doing a Facebook live saying, Hey, we're doing a, um, a cash mob at this business, or these are the, the COVID guidelines or the CDC is saying this today and the governor's um, making these mandates in our community and just being authentic and, and owning that this was new to all of us. Um, and I, I think that when COVID is moved on out and I look forward to that happening. I hope that those uh, traits stay with our industry because they're, they're necessary. And I think they make people better leaders mm. um, when you're authentic and you can lead with empathy. I think that's great. Uh, and, and you're, 
you're right in the case studies and, and what it sees. You know, we've unfortunately had a number of chambers call us and say, just to let you know, we're shutting the doors, like literally closing. Uh, and we've had others that have called and said, you know, we don't know what to do with staff. We're having a downsized membership going down. And then we have those others that like they don't even need a sales force because they've had such a wave of new members. And wow. when people go, why? It all goes back to what you just said. Those chambers were authentic and they empathized with the businesses wow. and people that have never joined before just said, that's where I'm going to park myself because I do yeah. feel that it is just kind of a, a, yeah. a title. And wave. they were innovative. Mm -hmm. I saw so many chambers um, create programming that was just off the wall, crazy, innovative. You know, where did that idea come from? But let's run with it. And, you know, that's what it kind of took this year is, OK, we can't do things like we've always done it. So what will we do? And where are the pain points and what are the challenges that we can provide solutions for? Um, Aaron Nelson in Chapel Hill, we talked about him this morning on a meeting because I watched as his chamber uh, partnered with some others to be able to buy PPE products at bulk and get them to their members. You know, 14 months ago, I doubt Aaron Nelson thought he was going to be buying hand sanitizer by the gallons and as a chamber and that being a service, but it was the service that was needed for his members to be able to keep their doors open and their businesses to be able to go to work every day. And um, so there's so many examples of those type of innovative pro uh, programs that happened this year. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, I mean, to innovate, you have to try. I mean, that, those have to go together. And I think as chambers, Sometimes we get caught up in such the propaganda that we have to be the example when actually if we just follow the example of our businesses and what they do day in and day out, they are in existence because they try to innovate Absolutely. new products and services. And so sometimes we can committee things to death. We can send it <laughs> if you're planning enough that sometimes you just got to do it. And yes, there might be a fail, but any business owner will tell you how they've had far many more fails that Absolutely. Had successes. And I think uh, hopefully if chambers take anything out of COVID, it is that for that particular season. And I'm going to mm -hmm. have to say, because uh, I, I just don't think you can be on this platform and not share. Because when we talk about innovative stuff and when we talk about innovative membership and, and those particular things, I go back to, uh, I believe it was your last chamber that you know the innovation that you had to go find a young kid with a garbage can business to become a member of the chamber and yes you had empathy and innovation for that kid but what you were able to get in chamber recognition for that uh yeah. what was going through your mind when you found that and like how can i use this you know um that's the authenticity, I think, is I never really thought, how will I use this? Honest to goodness, I never thought, how will I use this? I saw a 10-year-old kid that wanted to be an entrepreneur that um, talked his parents into helping him pass out flyers in the neighborhood that he would roll their garbage cans. I thought about him just today as I rolled my recycling can in off the curb. Um he wanted to have that as a business and charge the homeowners to bring in their cans every day or once a week, um, sometimes for elderly, sometimes for working parents or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and it went so well that he started employing some of his friends and grew the business to other neighborhoods. And I, the thing I love the most about it is he had the, the forethought to um, have books for the business and he saved a certain percentage and he got to spend a certain percentage and he put a certain percentage back into the business to develop different marketing. And he eventually got an app and did some great things and got some recognition. But I saw him on the local news one night because they covered him. And I thought, here's this 10 year old kid doing what we want all of our entrepreneurs to do. And that's succeed. And so um, I just said, hey, let's make him an honorary member. 
let's bring him to the chamber and do a ribbon cutting and we'll invite the board of directors and have him tell the story about his business. And personally, I thought this will be a good motivation thing for our board to see because he's an entrepreneur and he's doing it. And he was a good speaker at 10 years old and um, I, he was saving money to buy a Jeep and he was only 10 years old. So it was going to be a while before he could use it. But uh, I called the Jeep dealership and said, Hey, can you give us a Jeep backpack or something? And they said, we'll, we'll do better than that. What if we sponsor a young entrepreneur award and they paid us $2,500 for the award, which was great. Um, but not only did the board members come to the ribbon cutting where we gave him his honorary membership, but, you know, so many in the community came because it was just a, a great thing to celebrate. And uh, the, the news picked it up and it got covered multiple times, which was great PR for the chamber. I'm not going to lie about that, but it wasn't ever the intention. Mm -hmm. um, and he got a web de designer called him, an app builder called him marketing firms called him and wanted to help. And um, last I heard, that's been five, six years ago, but last I heard um, he had more employees and he had expanded and you could actually have a little franchise of his business. And um, so, yeah, it was just something that uh, I know some other chambers have, have used it since, but um, there's great ideas out there every day. Well, and, and I think you're so right. It's the authenticity of just, looking for an opportunity. It wasn't that you were looking to cash in on it. It was, right. you were just looking and then saw it. And I think that I, I've said for a long time in this business that I feel sometimes we as chamber professionals become our own victims and that we believe some of the propaganda that we spin out mm -hmm. as chamber professionals. And so sometimes it's just back to that authentic aspect in those yeah. regards. Well, so, we all need some good news every once in a while. We absolutely um, do. So, that was some good news. I'm going to ask you one question, and then we're going to go to a little personal side. So if you uh, know anything about Anissa, you want to hang around for that uh, rapid fire question, if you think you know about I'm it. nervous. Uh, but <laughs> as, as we conclude today, and thank you so much for being generous with your time, starting out a new job and you carve out some time for TRC Talks. Thank you so much for that. But uh, let's say people just jumped on or they're seeing this at the end. Uh, anything you'd want to put into a nutshell about Chambers utilizing ACCE or joining ACCE? Just some final thoughts on uh, Chambers and ACCE. Well, um, this is going to sound so pitchy and canned, <laughs> but I swear it's the truth. And I would have said this, you know, six months ago before I joined ACCE as staff. Um, it's one of those things you can't afford not to do it because every single time I put money towards going to convention or going to a professional development program, I got that money back mm -hmm. because I learned something that was going to make my job easier or mm -hmm. better. Um, or I got an idea that I could take back to our community and say, hey, we might need to switch it a little bit and do it a little different in this community. But what if we tried this? I heard about this idea. Um, and, you know, the money then pays for itself because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I would end up netting X amount on whatever program that was or just learning how to do things better, or more efficiently mm -hmm. or, um, you know, we have some amazing, amazing creative people in this industry. And, you know, you've always led the, the 60 ideas in 60 minutes. And um, sometimes it's 180 ideas in 60 minutes, it feels like. But uh, and then I think, why didn't I think about that? Why did I not come up with that? That's brilliant. And um, I truly believe that it's one of those things you can't afford not to do for yourself and for your staff. And much like members, when they join your chamber. Sometimes they think the CEO is the only one that's the member. And that's not true, as we know. But the same thing is true for ACCE. It's not a individual membership. If your chamber is a member, your staff is a member. And I encourage your staff um, to get involved, you know, as well and learn some different things. One of the things that Carol Gray, my, my first president and CEO, one of the best things he ever did for me was to tell me when you take professional development courses, 
Don't just take the ones that are in the area where you're working right now. Like if I was in membership, he would encourage me to take economic development courses. If I was in economic development, I might take some entrepreneur classes or, or finance or, or law classes about running a chamber so that I became more well-versed. And there's just so many great opportunities to take advantage of with ACCE. So I would encourage people to, to dive in and look at the benefits and see what's available and, and start doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You ready for lightning round? No, <laughs> <laughs> I am nervous. <laughs> okay, my friend, what's your greatest Zoom pet peeve? Oh, goodness. Um, I don't know. Let's see. The greatest Zoom pet peeve. Um, well, I do it all the time. I'm always on mute and I'll just be talking away. I don't know that I have a pet peeve because honestly, that's what I love about Zoom is it gives you that little snippet into people's lives. And I actually like seeing dogs on Zoom. Oh, absolutely. And and pets and babies. I want I want this was a chamber. I will not call them out, but I was on a call with a couple of chambers and someone's little toddler, not even maybe two years old, started climbing up the back pantry shelves behind their mom and the mom didn't have a clue. And I was like, your baby is climbing up. <laughs> and um, dad came in and swooped the baby off the, the counters. But, um, you know, it, it gives us a little look into everybody's real life. And this is not my real life. This clean <laughs> wall back here, I can assure you. But uh, I think Zoom's been great, you know, and it's allowed us a um, uh, little look into people's lives. Well, I had to say what you said is the antithesis of my pet peeve. Being a presenter for a year and a half on Zoom, I cannot stand a black screen with somebody's name on it, especially yeah. if it's a one-on-one. It's hard. If it was going to be one-on-one, just pick up the phone and call me. I, I mean, I don't yeah. need to do this. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. It is, it is hard presenting to... Um, a faceless wall without the expressions and uh, knowing when a, when a, your comedic timing is off or Absolutely. on. Absolutely. And it's hard to tell. Yep. Yep. Okay. In honor of what would have been Harper Lee's 95th birthday today, who is your favorite character in To Kill a Monkey Bird? Oh, well, of course, Scout. Of course. Of course, Scout. Is there it is my favorite book. I read it once a year, whether I need to or not, I can almost recite it. But uh, yeah, happy birthday, Harper Lee. But um, yeah, and, you know, all the characters, Boo Radley, you know, mm -hmm. you got to love Boo Radley, but all of them, but mm -hmm. definitely Scout. I kind of, I kind of relate to her um, off center um, zest for, you know, um, spontaneity, I guess. Yeah, that's and I can relate to that for sure. Yep. Okay. You used to travel a whole lot. What is your must have airport snack? Oh, um, you know, I, I, this is going to sound not true, but it <laughs> is true. I take my own snacks with me when I travel, whether I'm car traveling or airplane travel. I love kind bars. Those are my jam. The kind bars, I love every kind they have of kind bars. So I take those with me. But as far as eating in an airport, like buying something in an airport, I don't really do that that much. Of all the times I travel, normally because I'm late getting to my gate anyway, and I don't have a lot of time to go find the snack. So I have to plan ahead of it. And I do not ever eat on the plane. Y'all, if any of you follow me, you know, I can I say this word on, on this show? Sure. Hashtag shit people do on a plane is um, my book that I'm going to write one day about things that people do on a plane. And I, my pet peeve is people that eat, you know, hot food like onions and fish sandwiches and things that smell on a plane. Is <laughs> my pet peeve. Recycled air. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Your favorite golden girl. Oh my goodness, Blanche. <laughs> I mean, Sophia, I, you know, they're all my best friends. It, it depends on what uh, mood, doesn't it? Yeah. Not? yeah uh -huh, but uh -huh. I do love, I do love Blanche. Uh -huh, uh -huh. 
if a movie was made of your life, what genre would it be? Oh, goodness. Not the 80s or the 90s. Those were just bad hair. Um, you know, I think I always said I would have liked, I was born in the 60s, the late 60s, but um, I would have liked to have lived parts of the early 60s, that hippie vibe. Um, but there's definitely parts of the 60s that would have been painful to live through. Um, for different reasons. Yeah. So I'd, I'd still say the 60s. Okay. Okay. Yeah. As your an older person. Uh -huh. Your go-to comfort food. Oh, my goodness. Mac and cheese. Um, yeah. I, I consider myself to be a mac and cheese connoisseur. Mm -hmm. If you will. And fried green tomatoes. I never pass that up on a menu. Wherever I am, if there's fried green tomatoes, I have to order them and judge them against all other fried green tomatoes. And that's a dish that I actually cannot make. I can make mac and cheese. I cannot make fried green tomatoes to do them justice. Okay. What is your favorite activity on a cruise ship? <laughs> <laughs> that's just wrong. <laughs> well, I'm thinking about it. I'll give the, I'll give our viewers a background. Um, I don't have to think about it. <laughs> Get him or off. Of the boat is my favorite activity. <laughs> Disembarkation. Yeah. Y'all have to forgive us. That's uh, uh, I wouldn't say it's even an inside joke because like a hundred people know it. Uh, God, I guess it was like seven years ago now. It's been a it's been a good little bit. Um, the Carolinas Association, both North and South Carolina chambers, had their state associations together, and they did a cruise for one of their uh, state associations, and Anissa and I were on there, and one of us took to the water well, and one of us did not, and as we were presenting, it just kind of kept going. It was quite- I was green. I have never been so green in my life as I was presenting. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't foresee myself going back on a cruise. You know, you've tried to tell me maybe Alaska or a different type of cruise, maybe in the future, but I don't know now that COVID and all of that, I, I don't really see myself going on another cruise. I think I'll, I'll stick to air travel. Stick to air. Okay. Not only is it Harper Lee's birthday today, but it's also national superhero day. Who's your favorite superhero? Batman. Look at that. Why? I've always loved Batman. I don't know why. He's just always, you know, Wonder Woman's cool. I love Wonder Woman. Don't get me wrong. But Batman has just always just, he just is fierce. Mm -hmm. And I've always liked Batman. Like all the movies. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Batman. Fierce. I like that word. That's a good word to wrap up with. Fierce there. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, you know, you are some fierce chamber stuff. I just tell you it not more, more than just in the chamber world. It is always an honor, you know, it just to be friends with you, but thank you for your time. I am sure many people got a lot of benefit out of today. And I will tell you, if you've got any ACCE questions, feel free to ring her up, but I will say former ACCE member on the chamber side. And as YGM continues to stay an associate member with ACCE, feel free to give us calls and we'll give you our opinions too. But until next time, next month, TRC Talks. Y'all have good blessings, y'all. Bye. Thanks, Jason.